Okay, thanks. Good morning. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, not about LaTeX programming or so, but uh, about testing. And uh, the work that I'm going to present has a bunch of authors over the years. I'm listing three uh, myself uh, because I made the slides and uh, some of the original <laughs> ideas. Joseph, who actually ran away and uh, produced all the code for the current version uh, earlier this year. And Will, who kindly produced uh, all or most of the documentation. <laughs> so that's uh, sort of a collaborative effort. Um, getting older, I usually start with thinking about what happened ages ago or mm. centuries ago. So I, I start a little bit with history. And uh, as many things, um, stuff happens actually starting with Don. Um, when he developed tech, he had two ideas um, which I think have been very uh, influential to what we did afterwards. One was uh, his, what I think he actually invented, the literal programming idea of, of combining chores and documentation at the same time. And the second, which I found very well, sort of impressive, um, was his trip test. Um, I, I'm not sure it was actually him sort of inventing test-driven development and actually he didn't do it this way around. He did it afterwards, but um, I think the way he actually set up um, this, this part of the code was very important for how bug-free we ended up with, with tech. And I found this very sort of um, good thinking and um, took away some of the stuff. So, um, what I took away from those ideas were two things. Um, one was um, the doc package or doc style back then that uh, I developed for LaTeX, later on also DocStrip. And the second thing was when we were uh, working on uh, LaTeX to Epsilon, um, the idea of the regression test suite, um, because we wanted to ensure that when we do a switching from, from one system to the next, we actually preserve as much as possible of uh, its features and making sure that it actually goes as well uh, as, as it could be. So um, we were thinking about uh, ensuring that the typesetting of 209 could be reproduced on 2E. Uh, um, we wanted to uh, build um, tests for, for any bugs that we uh, fixed, uh, so where we actually change things but also testing each of the interfaces. Now, interfaces is a different thing and difficult thing in, in, in LaTeX, but, um, but we try to get, get as comprehensive as possible there. So, a uh, quick excursion here on Doc. Uh, this is, I think, something like 87 eight or so, so it's ages ago. Um, when I was thinking uh, about literal programming, I wanted to have something like this for LaTeX. I mean, back then, LaTeX had a, a source file, which was just code, and a separate file, which would these days be recognized as Word, as a Word document, because it had the ending dot doc. And, and that has some documentation, was completely separate. And that was basically everything that was on, in terms of documentation of the code. And um, so I wanted to have something for my own packages back then. And so I came up with the idea of, of having something which is First of all, easy available, and second, it should work on any platform. And these days, tech platforms are, well, the tablets and uh, the, uh, Windows and, and Linux and Macs, but uh, back then it was also mainframe and uh, VAX <coughs> machines and what have you. So um, what are you actually going to take there? That's, that's not an easy, easy answer uh, to, to make this work. Don did use Tangle and Weave, so different programs, but this is something I didn't want to do because you don't get that out to the people. And um, so my initial ideas have been to um, go and use a single source and make it possible to, to interpret the source in two different ways. First of all, it should be directly readable as tech input, and secondly, if you do some sort of magic around it, you could actually produce this from the same source of documentation. Um, the side effect, as we all know, we ended up with a very strange format. 
something like percent and then a fixed number of spaces followed by some code. Um, the percentage always sort of were hidden the documentation and then you could take take a change and then you could actually do the documentation type setting. But that, that ended up being a little bit of a sort of strange uh, result and these days it's a little kind of unfortunate but it is the way it is I guess and uh, people have used it quite a lot. That was the initial idea. The problem of course was um, tech was very slow. Back then typesetting a page could take up a minute easily and um, even reading in a file with a lot of percentages was slow, slowing things down. So people were starting to ask for how can we get rid of this documentation. So um, the next th idea was then we need something that takes the documentation out so that we have production files that are fast, faster. Also, it was completely linear and with two epsilon we started to have the need for producing different bits and pieces, different, uh, different uh, execution files from a single source. Um, it was no longer a single monolithic uh, file that uh, was being used. So, we had additional requirements and docstrip start, uh, was, was one of the ways to make this um, work. Question then is, what do you use as a scripting language for this? And um, the only sort of workable answer back then that I came up with was, what is common to mainframe, VAX and PC? Well, tech. And so we implemented the whole scripting in tech. So docstrip was the scripting language for doing sort of the post-processing and was itself a tech problem. Therefore it was automatically available with any installation. Um, you don't have to read this, but when we were starting to, to uh, build 2Epsilon and we were looking for validation and uh, testing, <coughs> we came up with a lot of volunteer tasks and asking for volunteers. The only interesting bit here is the bottom. Um, that was my thinking and I was wrong as um, a typical Knuth, uh, Knuth um, um, factor. <laughs> um, you take the next, um, the next, um, uh, what's it called, the next um, size, so instead of weeks, say months, and then you do uh, square. So something about <laughs> close to a year uh, was what we actually put into, into building those test files by the end of the day. But uh, I think it was really worth it because we, we actually managed to get these things uh, going. So, um, yeah, so much for initial history. What have been the needs? Basically four back then. We had verification needs. We wanted to make sure that the 209 stuff was reproducible. It was actually working the same. We also wanted to make sure that the documentation we were going to produce actually compiled and compiled correctly as possible. Second was, this was new. As I said, initial LaTeX was one file, one documentation file and uh, what is now nowadays called class files, which was called style files back then, but, but they had not much of the documentation. We started out with many more packages, many more files, so the distribution was much more complicated. We had a way to manage that. We had to make a way to test this. Um, licensing information actually came a little bit later. Some At some point, Carl and Thomas Esser gone crazy and <laughs> tried to find everybody on the planet to, to ensure that um, they uh, come up with the proper licensing, uh, licensing information in their files, which was a huge task. But yes, this was also something that we, we had to put into all the files, so that was something we wanted to do in the system. And instead of having a single person developing something, we had a bunch of people all over the world helping different operating systems they worked on. So 
that installation stuff got much more complicated because we had to make it work on different kind of computers, different kind of operating systems. So that, that was another challenge. And finally, you want to make as much automatic and as little manual as you can. So that's, that's really one of the key things. Because everything you have to do manual, you, you don't do after a while. Or you do it incorrectly if you do it because you forget stuff, etc. So that was key. What was the approach for testing and, and those things? Well, first of all, what's the problems that you are talking about here? If you think about LaTeX and, and, and you have some experience with it, there are a lot of hidden dependencies. You change something here and suddenly something completely independent blows up. Um, that's an unfortunate fact of life. It's partly because there have been no proper interfaces back then and there are still no proper interfaces in, in many places. So people got creative, which is fine, but then you have to understand where the creative stuff is sort of making dependencies. Um, you have a lot of overlays, packages, change stuff, replace it, and then obviously if you're not aware of those replacements, stuff is going, going to be um, breaking and, and so on and so forth. So the next thing to ask is how do you test for typesetting correctness? I mean you can look at the output like we did in the previous talk. Is this the same as this, the one before? But how do you actually make sure that you can do that each time again? It's not easy. Uh, how, do you, how do you test tech interfaces? What, what actually is, is the interface? What, what are you going to, to how do you ensure this today and in five, five days' time, five weeks, whatever? And lastly, how do you avoid as much as possible that your tests actually claim something is wrong and they are, technically speaking or visually speaking, no differences? So that's, 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 that was tough there. And uh, the idea that we came up with was, well, Tech has a log file. We can try to write the right kind of information in this log transcript file. And there's a way to have symbolic representation of pages, of boxes. So we can write this out and, and use this kind of information for verification later. Um, problem is, the log file contains a lot of stuff. Some of it is not quite relevant for this task. For example, each time you run tech, it puts a date in. Each time you run it, it puts the full file name if you're unlucky. Now this file name certainly might contain my directory name, which is my username, which is not the same username if somebody else is trying to run that test. So there's a lot of data that you have to take out before you can actually make use of this log file. And then comes the same question as with, with docstrip. You have to do this in a way that it actually works all over the place in the world. So again, what's the technical me method to, to manipulate this, this kind of stuff? Um, some best practices on this, sort of going through. First of all, trying to keep your output as small as possible, as large as necessary. Um, use stuff like type out, show, um, to get back to values. Don't use something like tracing all. We did this in some places, but the point is, what you're then testing is your implementation, not your interface. You shouldn't care about how it gets expanded. Well, sometimes you, you actually want that, but normally you don't. So you don't want to see how it comes to the result. You want to see the result. Um, there are a couple of tracing parameters that make sense. You, if you have a certain situation you want to test for um, how page breaking happens, how, how tech decides this, then you can use tracing pages, stuff like this, to actually record this information. So that's useful. Um, sometimes, you, as I said already, you have something like show lists, you have something like show box, you can get this symbolic representation. And that can be useful, but it can also be quite large, so you have to be careful because 
Well, you could record everything like that, but then if something changes and you actually have to decide, is this change correct, deliberate, because I changed something in the code, so it should change, or is it not? It becomes even becomes more and more difficult to actually decide this is a correct inference. So um, one has to be careful here. Uh, and about cleanup, as I said, there is some some data you really don't want to, because it changes every time. There is noise um, that is okay, but you don't want it because you, if you do comparison uh, for correctness, that's that's irrelevant for you. So we implemented something like a bunch of strange commands, start, stop, end, omit, and the corresponding Timo, um, to, to show in the test file, this is the stuff that we care about, and anything outside those regions you, you, you have to throw away. So this basically puts something in the log file, which we could identify and then say, okay, every line from here until the next something goes out. Furthermore, we have to do some sanitizing like dropping full qualified file names to as little as sensible. Um, yeah, all the web to c implementations made a lot of sort of issues because I think nearly every year the line breaks and the log file changed. <laughs> uh, more spaces, less spaces, breaks at different, um, I, I don't know what happened there, but it was really, really awful. <laughs> so uh, we ended up, um, for example, dropping everything was, which was an empty line, because sometimes the tech implementations were putting those in, sometimes not. Don't ask me. The other thing is line numbers. If you do a little bit of a change in your test file, and you have explicit line numbers being output in the log file, they all change uh, following your change if you add an extra line. So something like on line 15 or on page something, we reduce to on line dot dot dot. Uh, of course, we lose information, but um, that was sort of the trade off we decided is okay. And as I say on the bottom, don't go too far, you can optimize and sanitize so much that you actually don't see your, your problems afterwards. So that's... It always yeah, exactly. Um, putting it together, that was the test file side. So we had um, files called LVT, LaTeX verification tests um, or something, and then test um, log files as the output which have been manually verified once and then got frozen as this is the correct you expect. And then we put a makefile system around that with a lot of targets like check uh, to test all the, run all the test files, doc to generate all the documentation files, um, clean something to get rid of all the rubbish you produce on the way, stuff like that, unpack back then, install to get it into the local tree, and also C10, which was trying to provide a LaTeX-ready distribution for, for the LaTeX kernel. And then something like save TLG, if you want to generate a new TLG file after verification to get it into the system, stuff like this. That was a make file, and it got complicated and more complicated over time. Um, so, that's basically the history up to, I don't know, 1994. Um, so trip test first, then I wrote this validation stuff uh, initially, then we did all these test files with volunteers. Daniel Flippo was one of the main contributors back then. We ended up with something like 300 test files for, for LaTeX 209 to 2, 2E. Um, and we had this make system being built to actually then have a sort of stable way to generate LaTeX um, distributions. And back then, I think we produced LaTeX releases a half yearly or something. Um, and I think two or three times we actually had to put in a patch file uh, because things got wrong despite the tests. Um, 
Yeah, then a little bit later, we tried to sort of improve the test file basis. Not that much luck. I'm still looking for volunteers. Not, so, um, there, not for 2E too, too much, but for, for, for other stuff. Um, then, not long ago, we decided that the make files got so complicated, we really didn't want to do this anymore. And uh, Reiner came up with the idea of using curl, um, cons, um, but that was Unix only. And at a similar time, we started to have more people actually using Windows. So they couldn't run the test stuff because it didn't work under uh, Windows um, em um, emulation for, 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 for Unix stuff. So that um, Sequin or so couldn't, couldn't run that. So that was not so great an idea. Um, then we got into using batch files for Windows parallel to the make, which was not good. Uh, actually, it, 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 it did help us a bit, but it was, um, I mean, this, this language. A completely different approach was needed. <laughs> yeah, so we finally decided, okay, let's let's go to a, to, to a new system completely. And um, coming back to the very old idea, what actually is next to every tech installation? And um, by now, these days, you will have Lua Tech around on on basically every installation. So we have a Lua interpreter. So we can run uh, and build the test uh, environment around Lua Tech. And that's, this is what we did. So what have been the new needs? And they are a bit different to what, what have been the needs when we try to do to Epsilon. First of all, <coughs> back then there was a single distribution. Now we have many. Why? Well, there's 2E which is still sort of being produced, tested, and sometimes we produce new uh, releases, um, and then uh, we, we should be able to, to test them. Babel is running separately, different release cycles, should, should have this kind of stuff. Um, LaTeX 3 code, Expel 3, uh, has its own test suite, which is fairly comprehensive, was the first one we had on Windows system, on batch files. <laughs> and um, there's also now third party code, because when we were doing this, we were thinking about other people may want to use that kind of thing for their own purposes. So um, this means that you have to think about um, some stuff differently than if you know exactly how your distribution is looking and you're just building for that. Second, which is not so different, but um, we have different operating systems to support. And again, this is new. Back then, we were using one tech engine, basically PDF tech. And that was using for tests, that was using for distributions, and that, that, that's it. These days, you have LaTeX on the other engines as well. And it is not quite the same. I mean, there are subtle differences because of the different functionalities. And um, we were trying to cater for, for the test sets to work with every engine. So you had to build some other ideas into, into the testing uh, environment. So what's the issues coming out of this? As I said, flexibility, many different distributions means different requirements. Uh, we had a bunch of hardwired sort of assumptions built into the initial test suite because that was what we needed. And that was the way LaTeX 2E setup was, was being done. And so that was hardwired into some of the make files, some of the other uh, scripts that we had. Didn't quite work already for LaTeX 3 code, so that we changed there, but it was different set of requirements <laughs> that we hardwired. And uh, so we had to get get rid of some of this. Um, and then there's an interesting new experience. Um, the spaces of Web2C now multiply with the engines. Um, there are different 
there's different output in the log file because the engines sometimes can produce different stuff like like um, kerning uh, information around uh, discretionaries and so they, they add additional nodes in the symbolic representation. Um, you have um, I think it is it is um, some of the engines add uh, a few more um, dimension types. So instead of millimeter, centimeter, inch, and so there were two more added, um, I think, in, in, in CTEC and LuaTEC. So the, the, um, some of the error messages changed because you should use P oh, yeah. stuff, um, trivial stuff, but obviously it, it made the output come out different if you run with LuaTEC or if you run with PDF tech. Um, and we had a lot of bugs found in LuaTeX. I mean, we, we found differences in, in, in our tests and it turned out it was not because we made the mistake, but because the engine was, was having a, um, one or the other problem. So we, we filed a bunch of bugs and then, of course, we had different outputs because the bugs were not yet fixed. So we said, okay, this output is correct. <laughs> <laughs> Um, to the extent that um, this this shows the bug, and oops, finally, an, a, another example that we came up. This is more sort of an internal example, but interesting as well. Um, building the LaTeX three code, Expel three, building all these these um, data types, we started to use when we extended the language to use more and more registers internally. And therefore, the register allocation numbers changed over time. So when we implemented a new type, maybe two or three registers, tox registers, what have you, got allocated. Therefore, in the test files, they all suddenly had new numbers. Now, of course, you can go all over your 500 tests and, and manually verify that they are all OK because they are now two numbers further down in the road. But um, first of all, that's dangerous and it's tedious. Because if you have to test for those, so many files just for such a stupid um, change, then uh, you're likely to overlook and certify the real bug that showed up in one of them. So what we came up with uh, is uh, that the test suite is pre-allocating a lot of registers. So whenever we made one of those changes, we just change the number of pre-allocations to keep it the same on the log files. <laughs> so that was a simple trick, but you have to come up with those kind of ideas around this as well. So that brings us to today, more or less, new system. We have a lot of automation now, compilation, testing, generation of documentation, and packaging for CETA. So if you have a package, if you have a, a, a bigger or smaller packages, you get basically everything like that out of the box if you use the system. It supports dependencies, not as clever as a makefile, if you, if you make the makefile really clever, but to the extent that we felt it's necessary. So if you have a package that is depending on some other package of your sort of um, arena, and you can specify that and it will compile both of your packages sort of in, in, in independence of each other. So this is very important for, for say, something like the um, Expo work, uh, LaTeX 3 work, where we have the kernel and we have uh, additional packages that grow over time and each of those additional packages depends on the, the, the kernel. So if if we if the tests for the packages happen, they make sure that the kernel is up to date and, and, and also uh, around in the uh, in the in the testing suite. So those kind of things are possible. Um, the second point is which is important is you can run the whole set in isolation, or you can run it with yeah thanks. Wow, well, okay, you can run it in in. Um, in sort of um, tech life mode, which is which is taking uh, additional resources from elsewhere. Um, the setup is script per module, um, per, mod per module or package. You have one script, 
And if you bundle stuff together into a sort of bigger distribution, you have one additional script for the whole bundle. Uh, if you use sort of our conventions, then there's nearly nothing to set up. If you use your own or it is diff more complicated, you have to do a little bit of customization that's possible. And we have a lot of documentation, or will be. <laughs> um, now it's already quite, quite ex extensive there. The setup looks like this, basically. Um, the default one, you, you build a directory, you put your source files, DTX, installation file stuff in, you, and the bundle is similar, you just add several of those directories and put one main Lua script on top. So how does the script look like? Three parts. First part is you specify the name of the script, module equal, the name of the, the, the module or package that you build, so Bracken. For example, if you need overrides, that's already the complicated case because uh, you, you want to do things differently. Then you have a middle part where you have variables to set. And on the bottom, you basically use um, uh, KPSA uh, as a possibility to find stuff. And then you find the code for a scripting environment by the, this way. Um, so you don't you can use your standard sort of um, distribution and, and let it find it for you. Um, here's an example of a module. Um, it's a simpler version, so you, you specify the module, you find, you find the, um, um, the, the script, the main, main code, and for, for the individual stuff, the only difference is now that we have a bundle. The main directory is not the current directory, but it's one up because you have several directories going into one. So that's the idea. So this is the case when you want to have a lot of things uh, customized. Uh, for for LaTeX 3, we have one file which calls, contains all the customization. And then you basically load that file to, do, to not repeat yourself on every directory again. And here we also decided to load the script explicitly because we want to have the whole thing run in isolation. So the script is sort of part of LaTeX 3 in that case. So that's a different to, to the last time. Good, so um, live demo, as long as I'm still alert. Um, I thought I, I, I try and, and, and just produce something. Um, LaTeX 3 has a comma list environment, so why not make this available as, as a LaTeX 2 e package for, for package writers um, as a standalone. It's not a very sensible idea, but easy to, to sort of produce. So write a few tests, uh, write a few um, uh, code interface or a DTX file and an installation file, build a simple script, some test files, and then generate. OK, so let's see. Since we don't have much time, I'm not going to write the DTX file and install. I already have it. <laughs> and uh, I'm not going to build the script, but just to show you how it looks. So that's, that's all I had to do in that directory. Um, call, call the script its name and, and uh, try to find KPS which And OK. So, um, yeah, I should. Let's see, oops, test files, did a bunch of test files, um, let's have a look, sorry, I'm going to look into one of them, um, so this is, this is the test, um, we have a bunch of sort of helper stuff, you can do it without it, the first one says try an expandable test with a name in the argument and then you do something, these commands, list, arc, reverse, are um, taking a C list, a comma list, and reversing all the, um, the, uh, the list uh, elements. So uh, the test tries all the various sort of strange cases. Back to the uh, trip test idea, you, you try to, to, to get it as bad as you can in terms of what can you forget to, to actually implement. 
So it tests for MT1, it tests for MT1 versus space, it tests for commerce uh, with nothing around it on either side and stuff like this. Um, things like that. And then the second one is also on reverse. So this is, this is one of the cases. So um, I'm just going to, to run that quickly. Um, so. so starting in the main directory. So let's check Lua, build Lua, check. You can, of course, um, do some abbreviation on, on this if you like to. So now it runs the test and it takes a little bit of time because it runs it with all three engines by default. And um, if everything is nice, then the log file, the certified log file, there's a single certified log file for which works for all three engines. If not, if you have specialties in, in coming out of the test, you can have different log, certified log files for different engines, so it wow. depends on the extensions. In this particular case, everything works the same on all, all engines. So this takes, and then it says passed. Okay, <laughs> so if you want to do um, documentation, you would do the same with um, using the t uh, target doc. I'm not going to do this for, for a sec. Instead, I just go back to the test file. Oh, shit, what is this? Um, let's go here at the bottom. Just assume we do a few more tests. We build a few more tests. So I move this end to the already prepaid, pre-made tests. Oops. So save the file. So now I have a new test file, an extended test file. And if we go to the um, shell again, I do, oops, check LVT. This time I just check for a single one. Um, what was it called? Uh, M3 or something. M3 C list. Mm, six, I think six. I hope. So now it's 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 just running one test, and it complains that it um, has differences, as you can see on the bottom. And I also see here the output of it. So I'm I'm now going to sort of manually. Uh, verify that my test is actually producing what it should be so I can look at this this one in more complicated tests I may want to look at the PDF output as well to sort of visually visualize in this case I had a test for counting one C list had three elements one had four so I was testing four and three so that came out correctly and then I was combining concatenating C lists and um, the test below there then shows um, that the output is, is correct. So if that if I'm satisfied with this, then um, all I need to do is basically the previous one instead of checklist, I go and do what is it called? Save. Oops, save TLG. So then it does the same. It, it, it runs the stuff and produces the, um, the TLG file and puts it into the corresponding um, environment. If I want to have a special TLG file for a certain engine, I would run it with an engine argument as well. So that you could have different outputs for, for different. So this is there now. So if I now run the test suite, it should compile again. Um, so instead of doing this, I just make as a final one a CTAN argument. And then this is doing all, all the things together, it, producing the documentation, so the doc thing it is going through all the, the tests. And then it produces a ready-made zip file, both with the tech live structure as well as um, separate. So this, this, this can work. Uh, what I'm not can what I'm not going to do because we are out of time uh, is is sort of showing something which I I tend to use um, um, make myself uh, sort of regularly 
putting something into a file by mistake and then saving later on, like enter, putting in a carriage return somewhere. And um, then the code is obviously wrong and it may not have um, may not be caught if you're not running something like a test uh, suite here. And this is one of the uh, advices for people actually using it. Always have one test which is doing nothing than loading your file. Because normally you try to avoid sort of having the load in, in your log files because there's output coming from various um, bits and pieces. But this one test should be there because if you have a mistake like this, it shows you um, in that particular case. So what you can see now is you we actually got a zip file. Um, you can't see the structure, but I think I don't have the time, but it comes out precisely the way you want it on, on CTOM, so you can send that off too. So, and I guess that's it. It's, 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 it's in, in, in this uh, Citron environment called L3 build. It's L3. part of the. It's very nice.